Today's guest professor has quite the reputation. Mr. John Vick, in the flesh. <laughs> That's right, interns. Please give Mr. Wick a warm welcome. With four action-packed films to his credit, John is the perfect person to help us study the human anatomy, shall we say, under pressure. <laughs> Must be Christmas, yeah? <laughs> For me, any day that I get to incorporate my love of action movies into medical education feels like Christmas. Those of you who've seen the latest John Wick installment will surely recognize this scene, which starts out as a poker game with unusually high stakes. So, you want to kill him? You want to kill him? I want to kill him? As we know, antagonizing Professor Wick is one surefire way to turn yourself into a hospital patient. Or worse. I'm going to kill you. Oh, looks like we have ourselves a, a genuine conundrum. But before we jump into the action, please note, this is an educational video. And as such, all depictions of trauma have been carefully contextualized within a lesson on human anatomy in accordance with YouTube's own community guidelines. All right, Professor Wick, take it away. Peter wasn't personal. Now maybe a little bit. John strikes first, using a playing card to leave a shallow laceration on the left lateral aspect of his main opponent, Killa's neck. Exchange the playing card with a more effective cutting tool and the scene may already be over. Killa's carotid artery and or jugular vein transected, leaving him in immediate danger of hemorrhagic shock, wherein enough blood is lost that the tissue demand for oxygen can no longer be met. The carotid artery, which supplies the brain with blood, and the jugular vein, which transcends transports blood from the brain back to the heart, both originate posterior to the sternoclavicular joints and run side by side up behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Killa can count himself lucky. Though, if I remember correctly, there was a Mythbusters episode that debunked the whole playing card as a weapon myth, since the card stock isn't heavy enough to transfer sufficient energy to human tissue on impact. But you know what does? If you guys want, we'll cover that in another video. But I digress. <laughs> Thrown with perfect accuracy, the relative weight of a playing card might be enough to cause a small corneal abrasion, thus disrupting the function of the eye in an extremely painful manner. My advice to this guy is just stay down. Since most abrasions heal on their own within the space of a week, he might escape an encounter with John Wick relatively unscathed. But of course, in the chaos that ensues, John gets his hands on a firearm and introduces his first opponent to the Mozambique drill, which incorporates two shots center mass, a larger target that is easier to hit, followed by a third, more difficult shot to the head of the moving attacker. Okay, Based on historical anecdotes, this technique was named after an operator in the Mozambique War of Independence, Mike Rousseau, whose first two shots were not enough to neutralize a close quarters opponent. There are plenty of accounts of people who have survived gunshot wounds to the mediastinum, a space in your chest that holds your heart, and other important structures, the lungs on either side of it, and even to the head. Of course, the thorax and the head are home to three of the body's five vital organs, heart, lungs, and brain. Side note, also considered vital are the kidneys and liver, but that's a topic for another time. I say this because this two to the body and one to the head protocol was developed to target multiple vital locations in quick succession, thus increasing the chances of neutralizing a target. I'm not sure what Killa thought to gain by provoking Mr. Wick, but obviously it wasn't an expert demonstration of the Mozambique drill. He's put enough distance between himself and John that he only sustains a shot to somewhere in the right gluteal muscle group or perhaps the posterior aspect of the upper right hamstring muscle group. 
As you'll soon see, Killa's wound does not hinder his ability to any great degree, leading me to conclude that none of the bones in the pelvis, lower spine, or femur were fractured, nor were any major blood vessels damaged. Killa is moving away from the projectile at the moment of impact, at relatively longer range for a pistol, and also carries some fat tissue, which accumulates in many of us around the gluteal region, hips, and thighs, right around the approximate area of impact. <laughs> All factors that may have mitigated the penetration of the projectile or caused a glancing blow. But of course, Professor Wick is a perfectionist and Killa won't get off that easy. For our part, who wouldn't want to attend class in a packed Berlin nightclub? <laughs> Judging by the sharp recoil experienced by the first two men and the absence of any exit wound or splatter, John has likely buried bullets somewhere in their skulls with entry points in the frontal bone. In the annals of maxillofacial surgery, Dr. Priya Jayaraj tells us, the force needed to fracture the frontal bone is between 18 and 1600 pounds, which is, fun fact, double the force needed to fracture the mandible and five times that needed to fracture the maxilla. In close quarters gunshot wounds to the head, the strength of the frontal bone and other bones of the skull isn't all good. You see, brain tissue is essentially electrified jello with a biological composition that is approximately 60% fat and 40% water, protein, carbohydrates, and salts. Neither the tissue nor the blood vessels and the nerves that run through it offer any meaningful resistance to bullet fragments contained within the hard confines of the skull. A bullet that penetrates a hard section of the skull may not have enough kinetic energy to exit on the other side. Scrambled eggs, anyone? Though flipping down concrete stairs is dangerous, anyone who survives an encounter with Professor Wick without a bullet somewhere in their body should consider themselves pretty lucky, actually. This patient may have suffered an injury to the right tibia or shin bone, which connects painfully with the corner of the fifth stair step, bearing their full body weight and momentum of the fall. At the moment of impact, the edge of the stairs run diagonal across the center line of the shin bone. Now, generally speaking, both the shaft or diaphysis and the end or epiphysis of any given long bone are relatively durable, while the metaphysis, the part where the bone begins to widen, is comparatively softer and more susceptible to injury. And yet, this impact, though it occurs at the center of the diaphysis, has fracture written all over it. Bones are excellent under compressive forces, but considerably less effective when bent, especially forcefully over a concrete corner that concentrates the force of the entire fall over a tiny section of the bone. With the structure of long bones arranged in bundles of rigid cylinders called osteons, it is easy to see why bones are most tolerant when forces are applied at the ends of these column structures rather than along their length. So while tibial shaft fractures usually occur in more high energy impacts like car crashes, the precise transfer of force present in this fall will do the job just fine. Due to the angle of impact, I would expect a transverse tibial shaft fracture, likely with a butterfly fragment at the site of the impact. Although there is also a possibility of a short oblique fracture as well, as a result of the additional rotational force applied as he falls down the stairs. If our patient survives, if that is, if Professor Wick forgets about him, if he will undergo operative fixation using surgical hardware. Ideally, an intramedullary titanium nail inserted by way of the knee to repair the bone. For approximately six weeks following the operation, crutches will be necessary to protect weight bearing while the bone is healing. Comparatively, the second impact where our patient falls onto the side of his body is far less concerning since the patient's weight is distributed between his leg, torso, and arms. Again, my professional advice, stay down. It seems like Professor Wick has other things to attend to.
perhaps Killa suffers from asthma, wherein the airways in the lungs can become inflamed and narrowed at times, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which refers to a group of diseases that cause breathing-related problems, including emphysema and chronic bronchitis. He may be inhaling albuterol, which relaxes the bronchial smooth muscle that lines the bronchial airways in the lower respiratory tract, promoting better expansion of the airways, thereby enhancing airflow. Or, <laughs> he could be inhaling something a little less innocent. What with living in the high stakes world of professional crime and all. It's okay. <laughs> Whatever it is, seems like it helped. Not many people can go toe to toe with Mr. Wick in hand to hand combat. The first barrage of punches and kicks, maybe I can let those slide. But these two throws are beginning to test the limits of hmm, maybe John wouldn't bounce back so quickly. Here, with John's knees slightly bent and upper body held by Killa at the moment of impact, his left lateral posterior pelvis is in position to collide with the edge of a concrete stair. I can easily imagine the ilium bone, which makes up the upper portion of the hip bone and pelvis sustaining a fracture here. The wing of the ilium, the iliac crest above, and the spine posterior above are not shielded to any great degree by muscle or fat tissue. Since these pelvic bones are near major blood vessels and organs, a fracture there can cause extensive internal bleeding and injury to other nearby structures, particularly if displaced. Here again, most pelvic fractures are caused by some form of high energy trauma, like a car crash. And while I wouldn't expect your average shoulder to have the force required, the concrete stairs with the right landing angle could easily concentrate the force in a small location. Obviously, John gets up and continues fighting, confirming that this is not what occurred. But in a more realistic fighting scenario, that chance would be higher. Though difficult to see, this second slam drives the left posterolateral aspect of John's pelvis right into the concrete floor. Killa is not a short man, and John is thrown over top of him from several stairs up. Sure, this time his left leg is extended in front of him, bracing his impact against the ground to some degree, but that's two big impacts onto the same approximate location. I wouldn't be surprised if John suffered an injury to his sacrum, the shield-shaped bony structure comprised of a five fused vertebrae, which is located at the base of the lumbar vertebrae and connected to the pelvis. An injury here typically causes some loss of function in the hips and legs, despite the fact there is no spinal cord in the sacrum region of the spine, because the sacral nerves provide motor control to and receive sensory information from most of the pelvis and the leg. But I mean, maybe action heroes don't get injured because they simply don't have time for it. What with being dragged across the ground by their tie and whatnot. Pressure around the neck could impair the function of the carotid artery and impede blood supply going to your brain. Or it may compress the airway enough to stop the air going to your lungs. But, by grabbing the tie, Mr. Wick engages Killa in a tug of war and takes the pressure off blood vessels and airways alike. Professor, I won't sugarcoat it. It's time for you to fight back. Killa really has the upper hand. Ah, the dreaded double ear slap. This move is the stuff of legends. Star Trek aside, the point is to deliver a blow with cupped hands to both ears simultaneously, thus driving a sudden air pressure wave into the ear canal with enough force to burst or rupture the eardrums. On his YouTube channel, Self Defense Tutorials, Stephen Kesting shared several quick anecdotes about this happening in real life. Back when they could do MMA right. with open hands and slap the head. I've also heard of it happening in boxing and the big soft glove landing right on the ears. The eardrum or tympanic membrane is a thin semi-transparent membrane that lives inside the ear canal and is extremely sensitive to changes in air pressure. In the simplest sense, when a sound wave enters the ear canal, the eardrum receives it, vibrating sympathetically with the waves. 
then sending these vibrations through three tiny bones in the middle ear, called ossicles, to the cochlea, a complicated mechanism in the inner ear that facilitates hearing. I'll spare you any more details for now. That will be quite enough. Thank you, doctor. But know that the cochlea is located right next to the vestibular system, which facilitates balance, and both systems are connected to the brain by the vestibular nerve. From a practical sense, if you disrupt one system, it's as good as disrupting the other. Find somebody whose ear forms the exact other half of your hand then that might work. But generally, a flat hand works just as well. Maybe Mr. Wick's fingers were cut and the space around the ear was insufficiently sealed, but Killa doesn't seem to have suffered the same as these two commenters from Steven's video. First, a clean spinning back kick to what appears to be Mr. Wick's jaw would easily be enough to knock him unconscious. In relation to boxing, a 2020 article written by Dr. Anders Hanel and published in Frontiers of Neurology explains, boxing knockouts are typically caused by a hook to the side of the jaw, which causes a rotation of the head in a horizontal plane. When the head rotates sharply, the brain, which is floating inside the skull in cerebrospinal fluid, is jostled against the interior walls of the skull. Concussion and loss of consciousness often result here, though exact neurological mechanisms by which acute loss of consciousness occurs is under debate. And then of course we have the fall. Professor Wick is damn lucky to have had his momentum broken by that floating concrete beam. Had it not been there, he may have continued to rotate landing 30 feet below on his head or neck. More on that later. I am more concerned about the first impact than the second as his back wraps sharply into extension around the beam. The thickness of the beam prevents serious hyperextension of the thoracic or lumbar spine, but the cervical spine and head appear to extend beyond the edge of the beam. Whiplash, a soft tissue injury to the neck, usually caused by sudden extension and flexion, is best case scenario here, though a severe blow to the head against the hidden portion of the beam is a distinct possibility as well. The strain on John's neck could include injury to intervertebral joints, discs, intervertebral ligaments, cervical muscles, and nerve roots. The ligaments and tendons in his flailing legs could also easily have suffered injury after being wrenched out of proper alignment at the moment of impact. I'd imagine a multi-ligament injury of the knee or dislocation of the shoulders or ankles would be possible as well. And yet, even after all that, John's spidey senses are still working. Here, at the moment of landing, he distributes his weight evenly between all four limbs, extending them out at an angle towards the ground in order to limit the impact on his torso and head. Kind of cat-like, don't you think? An elevator would have been better for the ribcage, but at least he avoids a direct head to floor collision. As you might imagine, broken ribs are common amongst fall victims, and since Mr. Wick's chest and torso bore the brunt of the impact, they're possible here as well. Oftentimes, when we refer to broken ribs, the bone has been cracked, but the structure of the rib cage remains largely intact. Though this experience is painful, a cracked rib has a promising non-operative prognosis and will heal on its own within three to six weeks. Although, that duration of time will feel like an eternity. In severe cases where a rib is broken into pieces, closer attention must be paid. The rib cage's job is to help protect the vital organs in the chest, such as the heart and lungs, from damage. And when a sharp edge of broken bone enters the space it is supposed to be protecting, injury to these structures or the major vessels may result. Depending on the severity, internal bleeding due to a blood vessel that has been damaged could result in dizziness, low blood pressure, organ failure, or the eternal KO, but may not be easy to identify without closer inspection. Carry on, professor. We'll contend with that possibility after class. In addition, if a rib is injured in multiple places, otherwise known as a flail chest, the ability of the chest to expand and bring air into the lungs is compromised. Meaning, it may be rather difficult to breathe while you are trying to fight. Multiple opponents. Ah, 
Men swinging axes recklessly. Right on cue. I wonder what might happen next. John buries the blade of the axe in our next patient's frontal bone deep enough that it stands firmly upright. That's one way to tickle the brain. Let's do some quick math. On average, the thickness of the frontal bone is approximately five to seven millimeters thick. Beneath the bones of the skull, three layers of membranes known as meninges, the dura matter, arachnoid matter, and pia matter, function as protective barrier against harmful substances and provide a small amount of shock absorption. Even the thickest of these three layers, the dura matter, typically ranges from 0.03 to 0.06 centimeters. The only other meaningful space between the surface of the brain and the skull is the subarachnoid space, as the name suggests, below the arachnoid matter, which measures between a few millimeters to a centimeter in thickness. When all is said and done, the axe head needs to penetrate approximately two centimeters to be touching the brain tissue. Anything beyond will result in severe damage to the brain. To my eyes, that one looks even deeper. Everyone wave goodbye Bye, to the frontal day. lobe. We're looking at a cerebral laceration where actual brain tissue is cut or torn, along with intracranial hemorrhage or bleeding inside the skull. When penetrated by an ax, the skull won't necessarily crack or split cleanly. It may shatter and cave, leaving fragments of bone inside the skull in the cerebrospinal fluid or throughout the torn meningeal layers of the brain. Professor Wick then proceeds to make short work of some other henchmen so that he and Killa can enjoy some alone time. And honestly, while neither of those two attacks would have been sufficient to incapacitate a person, I'm glad that they decided to stay down. If I just witnessed two of my colleagues' skulls split open like a log, I probably would too. Hold up. Is Killa taking notes from the WWE? So the clothesline injury mechanism, where a blunt object impacts the anterior neck below the chin, is commonly associated with crushing injury to the laryngeal and or tracheal cartilage, which can result in airway obstruction. Furthermore, Dr. Eric Ernest wrote in the Journal of Emergency Medical Services, direct blows to the anterior neck can compress and potentially rupture the carotid artery, causing a rapidly expanding hematoma that has the potential to distort or occlude the airway. I like it like, and now, Even Professor Wick, despite his unmatched survivability, is nothing without oxygen. Here we are presented with a reminder about the dangers of strangulation, which we spoke about earlier on in relation to the tie drag sequence. If compression of the neck is severe enough, cerebral perfusion, meaning the bathing of the brain and blood, and associated oxygen delivery is threatened and can lead to asphyxia and rapid neuronal death. Without oxygen, the brain tissue cell death occurs within minutes. Excellent examples of blunt strangulation and penetrating neck trauma in one short sequence. Professor Wick, I must commend you on your lesson planning abilities. Here, John delivers a penetrating blow to Killer's neck with some mystery weapon. And though it sounds painful, it looks to have missed the carotid artery again, since Killa is able to continue to fight. Though it seems now that Professor Wick has gained the upper hand, controlling Killa and pinning his arms in full mount position. What follows is a barrage of unblocked punches to the facial region of our final patient. There are 14 facial bones, six paired or mirrored on the left and right in symmetrical pieces and two unpaired. And all of them are liable to fracture under the force of an uncontested punch. An article written by Dr. Ava Gomez Rosella et al. and published in Insights into Imaging Journal tells us, after the nasal bones, the mandible is the most common site of facial fracture Mandibular fractures often require open reduction.
For Mr. Wick to target the eye or cheek region, injury to the orbital bones and zygomaxillary complex could easily result. I sure hope Killa has a good plastic surgeon on call. <laughs> That is, if his last ditch effort to escape is successful. <laughs> Which it likely won't be with an ax in his hamstring. Technically, if you're going to have an ax embedded in the muscle belly of the hamstring, or any other muscle for that matter, it is more advantageous to have it embedded following the natural direction of the muscle fibers. In most muscles, the fibers are oriented in the same direction, running in a line from the origin point to the insertion point. If you've ever cooked a large cut of meat, you'll know what I mean. A laceration that follows the natural line of the muscle fibers will be less likely to sever a tendon or ligament which often runs parallel to these structures. Oh, that'll do it. Yeah, that's kind of what I imagine would have happened to John had the concrete bean not been there earlier on in the scene. Killa plummets headfirst onto the concrete stairs, and thankfully, camera angle doesn't afford us the best view of what exactly happens. It's almost as if his head disappears into his torso upon impact. However, judging by the angle at which his body falls after impact, it seems likely that his head is pushed down towards his right shoulder and his cervical spine forced into extreme lateral flexion, with his entire body weight crashing down behind it. This could easily cause an extremely comminuted skull fracture, extensive cervical spine fracture, or dislocations, widespread injuries to the cerebral tissue or brain matter, or a range of neurological injuries, including catastrophic injury to the spinal cord. And there is no getting up from that. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover next down in the comment section below. Remember to join me at my online gym, Humi 2.0 Fitness for free, right here on YouTube, where we help you move better and prevent injury. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.